I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points. So today is the final episode of season one. We started this podcast around the summertime in 2023, and it's been a spectacular ride and really appreciate all of the listeners and the comments that we've received thus far. And we thought there would be no better place to end the first season of the Data Chronicles by then predicting what's going to happen in 2024. And so to engage in a conversation about what we think is going to happen next year in the field of data protection, privacy, cybersecurity, all things data, Eduardo Usteran, who is my co-lead of the privacy practice here at Hogan, has agreed to join me. Welcome, Eduardo, to the podcast. I think it would be great, Eduardo, just to jump right in, and maybe I'll ask you to give your predictions from an EU and UK perspective, and I'm happy to share my perspectives from a US perspective and be very interested to kind of see how we see these trend lines moving on both sides of the Atlantic. And let's start with everybody's favorite topic, and that is artificial intelligence. Eduardo, there's probably very few people out there who have been thinking and writing as much about AI than you have from a European perspective and what's happening in the UK. What do you see as going to be the developments on how AI may be regulated in Europe and in the UK in 2024? Of course. Well, I think it goes without saying that AI has been the hot topic of 2023 at many, many levels, and it's bound to continue to be a hot topic in 2024. But I've been thinking about this, and I think that one of the changes we're going to see is a bit of a shift in terms of the focus of the pressure on privacy-related issues in relation to AI. Because a lot of 2023 attention has been given to generative AI and chat GPT and how models are trained and so on. And that may continue. But I think the real focus of 2024 is going to be on the use of AI for automated decision making. I think if you look at the future of AI and where it is going, it is the idea of machines making decisions. And when those decisions affect individuals, that is going to be addressed certainly in Europe by provisions like Article 22 of the GDPR, which is specifically designed at addressing the previous implications of automated decision making. So I would say watch out for that issue as a top area of concern for 2024. But anyway, what about you then in the U.S.? What are the trends that you see emerging in this respect in the U.S.? I'd agree on automated decision making. In fact, you know, that could already be an early trend in the late part of 2023, because just a couple of days ago, California released proposed regulations on automated decision making under the CCPA which go to many of the issues that you're describing, Eduardo, around what is the context in which organizations need to disclose how they're using automated decision-making technologies and in what context individuals can opt out of having their information be used in connection with automated decision technologies. Really fascinating issues where I expect, to your point, that we're going to see developments both in the U.S. and in the EU And maybe it's not going to surprise you, Eduardo, that the U.S. legislatures are not going to pause there. And we have seen, what, 12, 13 states now who have adopted their own versions of comprehensive privacy laws. My guess is that maybe by the time that we sit here next year, that that number is going to be north of 20 states that will have data protection laws in some shape or manner. Some of those will look very similar to the ones that we've seen in California and Colorado and Virginia and Connecticut and so on. And I think we'll probably see more that are more sectoral, more specific about specific types of data, in particular, sensitive data. We've seen that with Washington and other laws that have gone into effect that layer on another wrinkle of more restrictive data protection obligations that apply to businesses and create new questions about what constitutes sensitive data and what doesn't. My guess is we'll see more states do that same thing. In addition to, we will likely see laws that are specific to 
AI. And, you know, Eduardo, I made the comment yesterday, I think on LinkedIn, that it seems as though I'm watching the trailer of a movie that I've seen before. The EU passes comprehensive AI legislation. U.S. Congress doesn't do anything. California leans in and embraces its own form of regulations relating to AI or automated decision making. And other states follow and thus create effectively the same makeup that we have with EU, US data protection law. My guess, my prediction, I don't think it's particularly bold, but I think it's a prediction nonetheless, we'll see more of the same in 2024. Importantly, my brother prediction, no federal data protection law here in the United States. Eduardo, interested in your perspective now, maybe putting AI aside, what about the European regulators' key areas of focus for 24? Any predictions? So we'll see some of the usual topics, but let me start by mentioning something which I think is going to be new. I'm sure you have observed at URAN in the US in the same way as in Europe is an increase in the technology being used by many organizations of all types to monitor their employees. For some reason, the vendors of this technology have been very successful in recent times because I keep getting inquiries about how to deploy these technologies, whether they are lawful, whether there is anything that needs to be taken into account. And with the proliferation of employee monitoring technologies, I can see and I can foresee a proliferation in the level of scrutiny of regulate by regulators of these practices. So thinking a little bit ahead, particularly if there are any of our listeners that are thinking of deploying this type of technology, the key thing to bear in mind, and I can imagine is almost the first question regulators are going to be asking is, have you done a DPIA? Have you basically considered the data protection implications of deploying this technology? It may not be unlawful, but can you demonstrate that you figured it out that it is lawful? So a call out here for the role of DPIAs, in particular in connection with this, again, technological trend that I think is going to be a real area of focus for the European regulators. And of course, talking of uh, regulators, what about the situation in the US? What do you see the priorities going on that front? Yeah, I can't say that we're there yet in the US on HR or employee related data, as you all are in the EU and the UK. You know, we have not seen the explosion of laws in that particular space, but my guess is that some of the AI oriented laws and the laws related to automated decision making will start to lean directly in that space. I think my prediction for US regulators is that there will probably be more of them in 2024 than there was in 2023, because there was more in 2023 than there was in 22. You know, in the US, we lack a single consolidated data protection authority in the same way that member states in the EU have or the UK or other countries do. We have a unique system, right, where we have a federal regulator to the extent that it regulates data as the FTC. And then we have kind of sectoral approaches of trying to regulate specific types of sensitive data primarily, including with HHS and OCR for the regulation of healthcare data by certain types of healthcare organizations. I think what that has meant is that there is frankly room and regulators at all different levels of their space see that there is room to become privacy regulators and cybersecurity regulators and they're deploying their jurisdictional authority over very specific industries and over specific types of companies to cover privacy and cybersecurity and thus I think we will continue to see that trend, including, I think, importantly, what is the future of who is going to be the lead privacy regulator or lead cybersecurity regulator 
in the United States? I think that's open for question. I think historically, we have always seen that the FTC was the lead, right? At the federal level, we have one, covers all of the state jurisdictions, but the FTC does not have the same type of comprehensive data protection law that the state of California does or any of the many other states that have adopted their own versions. And as a result, there could be a changing of the guard almost around who the community sees as the most important privacy regulator going forward. And that may no longer be HHS for healthcare data. It may now be the AG of the state of Washington or may not be the FTC. It could be the California AG and the CPPA. I think that is all ripe for activity in 2024. Eduardo, I know one of the areas that you spend a lot of time working with clients on has been international data transfers. And that has obviously been a super important issue over the course of the past, I don't know, five, eight years, ever since the safe harbor was invalidated. And then the privacy shield was invalidated. And now we're on our third version and the challenges to the SECs. What is your view of what 2024 is going to look like on international data transfers? Well, you bring up my favorite topic in a way. And this topic, it has to be said, that has been around for many, many years. So my entire career, pretty much, it was in 2023 when we saw the largest fine ever by any data protection regulator in the history of all regulators and the history of the GDPR on this topic. Meta was fined over 1 billion euros. This is 1,000 million euros uh, for failures in relation to their international data transfers activities. And of course, anyone would think, but how can Meta operate without transferring data because it's a global network? And the issue here is that we've seen probably very radical approach, very dogmatic approach on the back of the last SREMS case, the last SREMS decision by the European Court of Justice, which is 2020, so a while ago. But as a result of that decision, European regulators have taken a very sort of no pragmatism allowed here. We need to make sure that to the extent there is any possibility of government's access to data, we tackle it. This has been saved by the EU US data privacy framework. So the third incarnation, if you want, of the same concept and this agreement between the EU and the US for international data transfers. So for a while, and certainly in 2024, I think we are safe in terms of the validity of the data privacy framework. And as you know, our recommendation to clients is to rely on the data privacy framework for international data transfers as a solid mechanism. But that doesn't mean that the thinking of the regulatory authorities has gone away in the sense that the way the SREMS 2 decision is being interpreted today in the EU by the data protection authorities is in that very dogmatic way, which basically says that the moment that you have the potential for access to personal data from by a government agency in a different jurisdiction, and that is in contradiction or in conflict with the European approach, then that is unlawful. So we'll see what happens with transfers to other jurisdictions, of course, because great, the US now have an adequacy finding from the European Commission, but it's the only country in the world that is not adequate, that has an adequacy finding in the sense that this is based on this framework. So what happens in relation to transfers to countries like China or India or Brazil, just to pick three strong economies in very different parts of the world, which don't have any arrangements with the EU, we'll see. But I could imagine that any of these go of the governments of the countries I've mentioned will have a strong powers, and we know they do from the transfer impact assessments we have undertaken. And therefore, we need to ensure that when we approach this, we have strong arguments in any transfer impact assessment to still 
make the point that whatever measures are in place, where standard contractual clauses or BCR or whatever arrangement is in place, is solid, is solid enough and robust enough to overcome any limitations that come from government access to data. So a big thing, international data transfers, and I know that's not something that you have to face in terms of exports of data from the US, but I know something that is coming as a big trend in the US. It's not so much the data transfers, but data concentration, which I've heard about. So why don't you tell us a bit about where you see that is going? Yeah, Eduardo, I mean, I think that's a great point. Fortunately, you're right, we don't have the data transfer issue out of very specific circumstances in the healthcare sector. And so that set of issues has not yet hit the US grounds. That said, I think there are so many other ways that these issues are going to present under other bodies of law. You remember, it was meeting one of a regulator for a very prominent US organization, I won't attribute it, but we were discussing what does it look like for the future of AI regulation. And I think the response was quite accurately, you know, like, well, it could be a while before we have a comprehensive AI law in the United States. But that doesn't mean that all of the other laws that we already have in place don't apply because all of the other laws that organizations have had to deal with and manage and comply with still apply in the same way. In other words, you can't discriminate against people in certain circumstances, and you need to make sure that products are safe and that they're reliable. All of those things that have always applied to products and services will continue to apply. And I think that's what we're going to see outside of AI, in particular, about how organizations are able to gain access to large amounts of information and what they can do with that information, which arguably, or at least in the regulators' minds, would constitute an anti-competitive activity. And I think that the larger the organization, obviously antitrust issues are always coming up, but importantly, many of the organizations have access to large swaths of data that give them insights that are not available to others in the market. And as a result, the confluence between data protection and antitrust and how organizations may be able to leverage and use the large amounts of data that they have collected through their variety of businesses will increasingly be not necessarily a data protection concern, but an antitrust concern by the FTC and other antitrust regulators. Interested, Eduardo, your perspective on other big things that we expect out of Europe. As I mentioned, data transfers. Anything else you're expecting in 2024? Yeah, I think, again, if you look at the trajectory of this year, aside from the big enforcement around data transfers, the other area of big enforcement has been, in a sense, an old chestnut, which is the lawful grounds for processing. And this year alone, we've seen a company, again, once again, Meta in the fireland, they have had to change the lawful grounds for processing, which is perhaps the number one compliance priority for most organizations because that's what allows you to use personal data in the first place. At the beginning of the year, they were relying on contractual necessity. and But contractual necessity, again, regulators looking at it in a very perhaps dogmatic way have narrowed down the concept of contractual necessity as a lawful ground or legal basis. And therefore, in the context of the internet and the use of data for targeted advertising, for example, was one could, I would say, genuinely argue that providing targeted advertising is part of the deal of accessing some content, perhaps for free. Regulators disagreed. So in that particular context, Meta moved to the obvious choice, which is legitimate interest, which is probably the ground for processing that most companies rely on for most of their processing. Having said that, the European Court of Justice came along this year and said, look, that is also to be interpreted in a very narrow way, and therefore 
you need to make sure that, for example, again, in the context of targeted advertising, the interests of the advertisers don't override the previous intuition that something like that can cause on the individual. And therefore, we are raising the bar of what that legitimate interest should be or can be in terms of relying on that as a lawful ground. And obviously, that has forced Meta to move towards consent. And again, consent is a very narrow ground for processing because the concept of consent under the GDPR is very, very narrowly defined. So we enter 2024 with a situation where contractual necessity is narrow, legitimate interest is narrow, consent we already knew was narrow. So how you find a lawful ground to justify your data processing is something that I can imagine is going to be a concern for many, many organizations because authorities are not going to change their views. So then again, for your to-do list for next year, if you are listening to us and you are in Europe or subject to the GDPR, make sure that you have a robust argument to say that you can justify your personal personal data because you have a lawful ground. And Again, not something that you guys need to worry so much about under U.S. law. But I know that one thing that people worry about in the U.S. is the contentious side of privacy and how litigation is, in a sense, driving much of the compliance requirements in addition to all the regulatory activity that you were also referring to. So anything interesting to bear in mind for next year, Scott, in terms of the evolution of the more contentious side of privacy? Yeah, Eduardo, it's a really good point. And I think 2023 has been, I don't have any data to support this, but it certainly feels like it was the biggest year of privacy and cyber related litigation. My guess is that 2024 will even be bigger than that. Number of examples to point to, but I think in 2023, I think One of the things that we have seen is that many organizations, maybe for the very first time, had to spend time learning how the internet works. And I say that not to be pejorative, it's just that there are many aspects of the way that internet technologies work together that is not commonly known or commonly understood, including how websites would be able to be delivered to specific screens for individuals or endpoints. But more importantly, who is providing and supplying different types of tracking technology from cookies to pixels to beacons and other types of tracking activities that are widespread and prevalent and who is supplying the technology behind different types of chatbots and who is providing the ability for streaming video All of those things have been the subject of masses amounts of litigation by almost every company in every different sector who just has an internet web page that provides, whether it's cookies or pixels or has chat features or has any type of embedded video, the idea of operating a website by itself created exposure in the US as plaintiff law firms were very much inclined to try to take old laws and apply them in new ways against websites. We've seen that in connection with the deployment of wiretapping litigation, where we have old wiretap laws that would you know, probably first came into being was to allow people to not intercept telephone communications. And we're now seeing that deployed against litigation against website operators or a law that relates to video service providers under the VPPA now be deployed against anybody who has embedded video on their websites. Or going back to traditional notions of what it means to have privacy torts in place and saying that the failure to have consents or notices that are in place describing different types of tracking activities on those sites would constitute privacy-related harms. I think there has been a great increase in creativity by the plaintiff's bar bringing action relating to privacy-related matters. And then on the cyber side, we've seen that explode as well as organizations have 
breaches, we're seeing a number of class action lawsuits be brought. And then as organizations say, well, maybe what I would want to do is avoid class action litigation because I know those are expensive. And so instead, let's put in arbitration clauses so that we go to arbitration instead. And then we've seen that be used against organizations as they have kind of mass arbitration claims, each individual arbitration claim having a dollar amount associated with it as a way of challenging class action waivers. All of that is spinning around us. And my guess is it will take several years for us to try to understand how to resolve all of the issues that just happened in 2022 and 2023, let alone the issues that we are going to have to happen in 2024. One of the things that I think will be a product is maybe for the first time, we are going to have a more established body of common law relating to privacy and cybersecurity than perhaps we've ever had before. And that may be really welcome, especially in the absence of federal legislation, because increasingly organizations don't know what they need to do on the cyber side. What does it mean to be negligent with respect to cybersecurity? Or what does it mean to have not reasonable security? All of those are difficult questions when you try to deploy old standards that were invented, at least on the negligent sides, hundreds of years ago, and then deploy that in a cybersecurity context. As we see these cases get litigated and we see them you know, actually result in decisions, it could very well be that well before we have any federal privacy or cybersecurity law, we have a body of law that was created through judicial decision that would embody kind of what the expectations are going to look like in this very important space. Eduardo, I'm conscious of time here, so I want to maybe wrap up by asking, maybe going back to the very beginning, I mentioned my first question, AI, and we talked about automated decision making, but there's this big looming thing called the AI Act that you know I think listeners will be very interested for any predictions or insights on what you think is going to happen under the AI Act in 2024. Uh, the regulation of AI, that is definitely, definitely coming. It wasn't too certain that it was going to happen just a week ago. But as you probably know, at the end of last week, the 8th of December, historic day for the regulation of uh, technology because the European institutions that are in charge of the legislative process reach an agreement amongst themselves to regulate AI through the AI Act. So the actual text of the law is still being finalized, so we can't just go through it right now. But what we know for sure is that there is agreement, there is what is called a political agreement on what the law is going to say. Now the drafters need to finalize it and translate it into all the languages of the EU. And this will be perhaps not the first comprehensive AI regulation ever enacted, because I guess the Chinese will say, oh, we were the first ones. But my prediction here is that the European EU or the EU AI Act is likely to become a bit like a blueprint for AI regulation compliance, if you want. And at least that's what the European Union is trying to achieve with it, a bit like what happened with the GDPR. And the reason why people like you and me are becoming more and more involved in AI regulation is because a lot of the patterns we have seen over the years in relation to privacy regulation are going to be repeated in relation to AI regulation. The AI Act is going to be a very, very complex law. And the reason why I'm saying that is not because I don't understand it, is because what I do know about it is that just what qualifies as an AI system and what type of AI system we're talking about will be a big deal. And I can imagine that many organizations next year will be looking at this law and trying to figure out which ones of their AI developments and their AI users will be subject to which provisions under the law. The law adopts this sort of risk-based 
approach, which is a very European thing. And depending on the use case we're talking about, different requirements will apply. So determining what requirements apply is the first very important step. And then obviously figuring out what to do to comply with them will be a job for many people over the next two years as the law becomes enforceable. So certainly something that is going to keep us very busy, not just in Europe, I would say, but globally as companies trying to get their arms around what this law is about. And then before we really, really finish, let me just raise another topic with you, because of course, a core aspect of our practice is the cybersecurity side. And you mentioned the role of cybersecurity in the context of litigation, but you and I get involved on these breaches every now and then, these cybersecurity incidents, typically on a Friday evening when we're trying to relax. And what do you see in terms of the trend for 2024? Where are we going to see the same amount of data security or cybersecurity incidents? Are we going to see different style? What is your prediction in that respect? Yeah, good question. And my prediction is that the supply chain will continue to be the target and the largest area of vulnerability with respect to cybersecurity. 2023, you know, had many incidents ended up impacting many different customers. And I think the way that our digital economy is developing worldwide, such that we have key suppliers and maybe not that many key suppliers who are providing services to so many businesses. And each one of those key suppliers end up having an incident which impacts many. One small incident impacting hundreds or thousands of customers is almost the norm in the supply chain. And that dynamic will continue in 2024. We saw 2023 have the prominent incident relating to MoveIt, the secure file transfer system that was designed to enable companies to move data securely from point A to point B and was designed to allow organizations to meet their cybersecurity obligations, be the target of an attack, which resulted in thousands of customers being impacted. That, unfortunately, I don't think is a trend that will end and thus an area that I think all of our clients who are looking to dedicate resources to where they think their largest vulnerabilities are would get a lot of ROI. So Eduardo, thank you so much for joining the 2024 prediction episode. I don't know, maybe that's going to be our title on a go forward basis. Maybe at the end of 2024, we'll have to revisit some of these predictions and see how close we were able to come. But I think one thing is clear, and that is that 2023 was a fantastic year for everybody within our practice and all of our clients for whom we are so, so grateful. And I'm going to also have one last bold prediction, and that is 2024 is even going to be better. Excellent. I second that. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining our podcast, The Data Chronicles, in 2023. We had a great time with you. 2024 is going to be back with brand new episodes. In the meantime, enjoy your holidays and a happy new year, and we'll see you on the other side of the year. I'm Scott Lachlan. This is The Data Chronicles, and those are your data points. Data Chronicles.